Hello, and welcome to Vandenberg Space Force Base on the central coast of California. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and you are watching the pre-launch news conference for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's, or NOAA's, JPSS-2 mission. JPSS-2 is the third satellite in NOAA's polar orbiting satellite constellation. The 36-minute launch window opens Tuesday, November 1st at 2.25 a.m. Pacific time, with NASA's Launch Services Program managing it. Once in orbit, JPSS-2 will help scientists better predict and prepare for extreme weather events, climate change, and so much more. And launching with JPSS-2 is NASA's Lofted, or Low Earth Orbit, flight test of an inflatable decelerator. Lofted is a partnership with the United Launch Alliance to test whether an inflatable heat shield can survive the searing heat of reentering Earth's atmosphere. This technology could revolutionize space travel. To tell us more about both JPSS-2 and Lofted, we have this extraordinary panel of folks here today. First to my left, we have John Gagosian, Joint Agency Satellite Director here at NASA. Next to him, Omar Baez, Senior Launch Director for NASA's Launch Services Program, giving a wave there. Gary Wentz, Government and Commercial Programs Vice President over at ULA. And next to him, Irene Parker, Deputy Assistant Administrator of NESDIS. Tim Walsh, JPSS Director, NOAA. Jim Reuter, Associate Administrator, NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. And then we have Captain Zach Zonas, Launch Weather Officer, also waving, thank you for that, uh, with the U.S. Space Force. So each will deliver some opening remarks, and then we'll take questions for those here in the room. Uh, you can just raise your hand, but those on the phone, you can get into the question queue by dialing star one, and then those on social media, you can post your questions using the hashtags either JPSS2 or hashtag Lofted. Okay, John, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Megan. Good afternoon, I'm John Gagosian, Director of NASA's Joint Agency Satellite Division. Our division is part of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, and we manage, on NOAA's behalf, the development and deployment of operational weather satellites like JPSS-2, the third of five in the JPSS series. We've partnered with NOAA for more than 50 years on the nation's terrestrial and space weather satellites in polar, geostationary, and libration point orbits. Our partnership has been very successful, having launched over 60 satellites on behalf of the nation to improve weather forecasting, severe storm and hurricane prediction, and climate observations. For JPSS-2, NASA is responsible for the formulation, development, launch, and initial operations of the satellite. JPSS satellites form the backbone of the global observing system, circling the Earth from pole to pole and crossing the equator every 100 minutes to cover the entire planet twice a day. I'd like to thank our industry team members Northrop Brumman, L3 Harris, Raytheon, Ball, and ULA for their hard work and dedication that have enabled us to reach this point. NASA is committed to the continued success of the JPSS program and its final two missions, JPSS 3 and 4, which are currently in development. In addition, NOAA and NASA are together formulating the next generation low Earth orbit satellite architecture. I'd also like to highlight the interagency collaboration that will allow NASA and ULA to perform the low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator, which Jim will describe in a few minutes. NOAA's cooperation has enabled this innovative public-private partnership to become reality. Thanks, and back to you, Megan. Thank you so much, and thanks for that shout out to our industry partners. Okay, next we have Omar. This is your last news conference. How are you feeling about that? He's I'm retiring. I'm feeling great. <laughs> He's such a pro. That's why. He's such a pro. He doesn't need notes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Megan and, and John, you stole my thunder. That's all the information that you guys had was what I was going to present. <laughs> <laughs> no, in reality, um, super excited to be here. Uh, super excited to be launching the last Atlas V from the West Coast, enabling ULA to have some uh, huge capability out of here with their Vulcan vehicle. And uh, not only that, but getting our JPSS-2 satellite up in orbit along with Lofted. Um, and hopefully it doesn't stay in orbit and comes back down into the ocean and uh, proves some great technology for great things to come. The uh, um, 
the other thing I want to mention is uh, this is launch services program, KSC's launch services program's 100th mission since we started in the uh, late 1900s. Um, so super excited to be here and uh, something to celebrate. We actually got a T-shirt out of it <laughs> that says 100. Um, so that is super cool. Um, the uh, If you could roll some, some footage that we have. And uh, I'll, I'll talk to that. This is the uh, the JPSS satellite and the Atlas arriving on the uh, Mariner. So um, that was uh, this happened in August. Um, we started the erection sequence here uh, in late September, um, while uh, the satellite, along with Lofted, were in Astrotech. That's Lofted there being lifted up onto the uh, payload adapter fitting, and then. JPSS-2 will go uh, on top of that, or is on top of that. And uh, that's the last of the uh, four meter metallic fairings um, uh, that this mission will fly on the 401. Um, this was accomplished about two weeks ago, um, last Monday, uh, not this Monday, Monday before they rolled out, they came out to six, uh, Slick 3, they made it to the launch vehicle perform the testing that has to be done after you mate the spacecraft to the launch vehicle. Um, and uh, this week we had our final readiness reviews along with today. We did our launch readiness review yesterday. We did our mission dress rehearsal. And the teams are, uh, this is a team sport. We have uh, NASA, we have ULA, the range, Northrop, Goddard, Langley. It's all a team sport. Um, and uh, we're all ready to go. Uh, so the next steps for us is Monday, Halloween day, we'll come in at night, hopefully not in our costumes because the gate cards won't let us in. But um, after trick-or-treating, we'll come in. Uh, the team will move the uh, tower away from the uh, uh, launch stand. Uh, we'll get into fueling the uh, launch vehicle um, and uh, hopefully get this thing out of here at 2.25 in the morning. We have a 36-minute window, um, so plenty of time to do that, and uh, just looking forward to a, a great launch on uh, Tuesday morning. Over to you, Megan. Well, sad to see you go, but congratulations on your retirement and LSP's 100th mission. That's an amazing milestone. Okay, Gary, take it away. Can you can you beat that? <laughs> I'm not sure I can talk. <laughs> uh, first, uh, uh, Gary Wentz, Vice President, Government Commercial programs for United Launch Alliance. Uh, do want to congratulate Omar on his retirement. That's pretty significant, having uh, over 30 years with the government, working launch services program primarily. So um, we've been been very happy with the support and, and partnership from Omar and the team. So um, it's been a busy few weeks here at Vandenberg. A few weeks ago, we launched our last Delta IV Heavy off Slick 6 and came back, uh, did a lot of preparations, worked with the integrated NOAA, NASA team to integrate the spacecraft, and, and now we're here to, uh, to scheduled on Tuesday to launch the last Atlas off the West Coast. So um, looking forward to that. The whole team here from United Launch Alliance is excited to be a part of this, this mission. It's bringing significant capability from an advanced environmental perspective as well as um, as was mentioned, the, the reentry capability that is key for our future going forward. Um, first, I'd like to thank our, our mission partners, Launch Services Program. Uh, we've been a partner with them for over 16 years, launching critical and historical spacecraft. Um, this is the 39th and final contracted um, launch with the Launch Services Program. We're looking forward to to future business on, on Vulcan on both East and West Coast. Um, after this launch, our team will phase into the modifications to convert Slick 3 to be able to launch the Vulcan Centaur from the West Coast. And uh, as, as Omar mentioned, we completed the launch readiness review. The team's not working any issues, and we're on track for a 2.25 a.m. Pacific launch here from Space Launch Complex 3. Um, I'd like to, to wish uh, the Launch Services Program congratulations on their 100th launch, and uh, thank you to all our mission partners that are key for us to be successful. So thank you. Over to you, Megan. Gary, thank you. Okay, Irene. All right. 
So we are now just four days away from the launch of NOAA's JPSS-2 satellite, the latest in a series of high-advanced polar orbiting satellites, which are improving the accuracy and timeliness of NOAA's numerical weather models and the quality of its global Earth observations overall. As many of you may know, NOAA operates multiple types of satellites, such as Discover in deep space, which is at Lagrange Point 1, which is approximately 1 million miles from Earth, the advanced geostationary satellites like GOES-16, 17, and 18, which orbit in a fixed position over 22,000 miles above the equator, and then our advanced polar satellites, namely NOAA-20 and our NOAA-NASA SUMI MPP, which circle the globe 14 times a day in a much lower orbit, approximately 512 miles above the surface. These satellite systems play complementary roles and are absolutely critical for NOAA to provide a complete picture of what's happening with the weather and the climate today, tomorrow, next week, and even longer. JPSS represents the latest and best technology NOAA has ever flown operationally in the polar orbit to, cap to capture more precise observations of the Earth's atmosphere, land, and waters that are improving NOAA's life-saving weather forecasts and they also provide environmental information essential for the nation, nation's economic security and development. JPSS-2 will join SUMI-MPP and NOAA-20, giving NOAA the benefit of three advanced polar orbiting satellites in operation. Tim Walsh, the JPSS program manager, will go into more detail about the orbital assignments. Against the backdrop of the deadly destruction of Hurricane Ian, in late September and Hurricane Ida in 2021, along with the destructive wildfires here in the West and in Alaska, NOAA's weather satellites have never been more critical as extreme weather events continue to be more frequent because of climate change. For example, from 2017 through September of 2022, the U.S. has experienced 104 separate billion dollar disasters. By comparison, from 1987 through 1991, there were only 15. Bringing the JPSS-2 satellite to launch pad has been a true team effort amongst NOAA, NASA, and our industry partners who have built the JPSS instruments, satellites, and ground system. Further, we are eager to support our international partners with these global observations as we work together to understand our whole Earth system. So in just four days, we'll see the hard work and sacrifice it took to build and launch the JPSS-2 come to fruition. Congratulations to the JPSS program and the entire launch team. Thank you very much. Back to you, Megan. Thank you, Irene. The, the number $104 billion disasters that really puts into perspective how important JPSS-2 is and how important weather satellites are. So thank you for that. Tim. Great. Thank you, Megan. And good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's pre-launch briefing for NOAA's JPSS-2 satellite. I'm Tim Walsh. I'm the NOAA Director for the Joint Polar Satellite System Program. It's an integrated program with our partners at NASA. Perched 191 feet above uh, on an Atlas V launch vehicle just a few miles away, uh, JPSS-2 uh, is the third satellite of five that will join the other two satellites in orbit on the uh, 1330, uh, it's just an early afternoon sun synchronous orbit, and it will be used, um, and this, this will be the, these constitute the next generation of low Earth orbiting U.S. weather satellites. The JPSS program is very excited to share our ride to orbit with the Lofted program, which you'll hear next Thank very you, shortly. Too. Yep. Uh, these, these JPSS satellites provide high precision Earth observations uh, that inform the U.S. public every day. Every, whether you're preparing for devastating severe weather such as floods, hurricanes, uh, and, and, and or droughts, or just checking next uh, Monday's weather to see if we're going to be launching uh, to see if we're, uh, how the weather looks in the morning. These satellites also add valuable information to climate records. For example, they give us long-term long records of the temperature of the atmosphere and show us how it's changing. After the satellite and instruments are checked out, JPSS-2 will observe every place on Earth at least twice a day, as the satellite orbits the Earth pole to pole 14 times daily. To predict local weather, we need to observe the weather from this global perspective. A dust storm in Africa can affect the development uh, of a potential hurricane that might impact the East Coast. A typhoon in Japan might result in a heavy rainfall in, here in, in California just a, several days later. The JPSS-2 satellite will carry four key instruments into orbit. 
The Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS, is essentially the eyes of the spacecraft, the eyes of the satellite. It measures the Earth in the infrared and visible part of the spectrum, and it gives us images of hurricanes, floods, dust storms, cloud patterns, and ocean color. It is also used to locate and map wildfires and track wildfire smoke. The Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, or ATMS, observes passive radiated microwave energy from the Earth to see through clouds and inside storms. The ATMS, in conjunction with the Crosstrack Infrared Sounder, or CRIS, gives weather forecasters a global 3D picture of the atmosphere's temperature and moisture profile, the most fundamental information required by our numerical weather prediction models. Our fourth instrument is the Ozone Mapping and Profiler Suite, or OMPS. The OMPS tracks the concentration of ozone in the atmosphere. Data from OMPS is used uh, in ultraviolet index forecasts, which is used to keep the public informed about the harm of UV radiation. OMPS also provides valuable measurements of a stratospheric aerosols, such as those caused by volcanic eruptions and wildfires. JPSS is a collaborative effort between our partners at NOAA, uh, between NASA and NOAA. NOAA funds and manages the program, performs operations, and provides the products to the user community. On behalf of NOAA, NASA develops, builds, tests, launches, and hands over the spacecraft to NOAA roughly 90 days after launch. And, and NOAA operate, NASA developed the ground system, uh, and NOAA now operates and maintains that ground system for the system, for the JPSS program. I really, really want to extend a heartfelt thanks to the group here in front of me and also represented by the, the NASA NOAA teammates across the nation, across the world, actually, with our international partners. And I do want to uh, I recognize that in the last three years, it's been particularly difficult to take the satellite to the finish line. And now we're just three days away from launch. I'm so excited about that. So thank you. J go JPSS2. Back to you, Megan. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and as you said, JPSS isn't going up alone. Uh, Jim, why don't you tell us about Lofted? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thanks, Megan. And I want to thank everyone for joining us here today, in person especially, and also on, um, virtually. Um, you know, we're really excited to be here uh, with all our colleagues getting ready for the launch of JPSS2 and Lofted. I want to thank especially all these partners of NOAA, NASA Science, and ULA for partnering with us to have Lofted on this mission as a rideshare. Uh, Lofted stands for Low Earth Orbit Flight Test of an Inflatable Decelerator. It's going to be a flight test of inflatable heat shield technology. I, to me, this is a really cool technology. I love it. Uh, <laughs> there's so many things that we get to do that are cool. And it's been in development for over a decade with previous smaller versions of flight tests of suborbital heights. Tuesday will be our first orbital flight test of the inflatable heat shield, as well as the largest heat shield ever to enter an atmosphere at six meters in diameter, uh, it's 20 feet. And so I, I brought a prop, and I think we have a couple of a picture or photos too. Yeah, so you can kind of see this is this is as it looks here. This is the fully inflated uh, version of it. So it you know it comes into the atmosphere and you needs to create a lot of drag. So as you're going through it, and this is the reentry vehicle. So this whole package fit inside here. Uh, before it inflated and stuff, so you can kind of get a see of the packaging. This is about 1 50th scale, so 2% or, or something like that, if you want to imagine how that would be. Um, and so um, the heat shield itself is really kind of amazing. It, um, it's made of flexible materials, you know, obviously since it, it can package so well. It's, it's um, like a woven thermal protection system. Uh, and the t tubes are woven into a synthetic powder, or po uh, a synthetic polymer, look at it, right, that's 10 times stronger than steel by weight once it's inflated and stuff like that. And so it's, um, the flexibility is what makes the, te te the technology so uh, valuable. It can stow for launch. Inflatable heat shields then become larger to land heavier payloads on, on Mars or return spaceflight components for low Earth orbit lowering cost of access to space. So that's why it's a perfect partnership between uh, NASA and ULA. We, it's a common technology that we can utilize to, to solve multiple problems. Um, I do want to mention one person in particular uh, to make, that really made this mission possible. Uh, Bernard Cutter uh, was ULA's former chief rocket scientist, I'd call him. Uh, he passed away unexpectedly in, in 2020. Uh, we wouldn't be here without Bernard. Um, and so uh, we're really honored to dedicate this demonstration jointly uh, to Bernard. Um, Tuesday's demonstration actually will happen pretty quickly. Um, that's kind of unusual in that our entire demonstration will take place 
125 minutes, about two hours, a little over two hours um, after launch to the time we've, we've had splashdown. Um, after JPSS-2 separates from the upper stage and it's on its way to orbit, uh, then lofted will inflate, re-enter into the atmosphere and splash down within a few hundred miles of the, off the coast of Hawaii. Uh, recovery teams on a boat will head out there to recover the aeroshell and a backup data recorder that we've uh, that we'll eject. So we don't absolutely have to. Rec we certainly want to recover recover the whole uh, the whole uh, system, uh, but we don't absolutely have to. The data is the most important thing, and so we have data that's coming that that is real time that will be but collected to the extent that we could with our bandwidth we have. Uh, we have a, a data recorder on the unit the, the system, and so if uh, you know once we recover that, then we'll have that. But we also have an ejectable that that's designed to float in the water. Um, recovery teams will head out there to recover the aeroshell and the backup data recorder, and then we'll be able to evaluate how loft it performed. And so that will really help, we, help to improve our designs, increase our reliability for future versions of technology. This is just the start as we go through it. And that's why our technology demonstrations are, are really so valuable, and this is one of the best ones we have. So we're looking forward to the demo, the ways it helps us, the next step in exploration. And, and back to you, Megan. Thank you so much, and thank you for mentioning Bernard Cutter, the, the one of the dedications on board this mission. There's also a second dedication um, from Mark Levesque, and you'll learn about uh, more about both men uh, during our launch broadcast, which we'll have during the launch. Okay, last but not least, Captain Zonas. You kind of alluded to maybe not so great weather. <laughs> I wish I had better news. Um, but before I get to my weather brief, I would like to discuss uh, expectations for November, especially for the members who don't live in California. Uh, those of you who have been ar around for Pascal Wallace, you've noticed that we've had morning clouds, afternoon, afternoon hot sun, and then sometimes we get a monsoon thunderstorm that rolls through like a couple weeks ago. Um, that is transitioning out, and we're moving into November and winter time when we start to get low-pressure systems and fronts uh, to push from the Pacific Northwest down to, into California. Those often bring uh, elevated winds, precipitation, clouds, and occasionally cold core thunderstorms. That's not going to be an impact for this, um, this launch, but the first three might. Um, so we often get roughly two to three fronts uh, per November uh, that lead to roughly six to eight mornings where we have pretty windy conditions. So now that I've set expectations, let's move on to the forecast. Could you bring up satellite, please? As you can see, we have a low over in the Gulf of Alaska um, with a front that drapes down from Canada down uh, to southwestward um, to over the central Pacific. Um, now that's gonna be the main feature that pushes in over the next four days. However, what's really gonna impact the primary day is gonna be that green swath of moisture uh, highlighted um, uh, on, is con connecting from Hawaii to Seattle. Uh, so what's gonna happen is that is gonna push all that moisture over us uh, around T0 during the count. And that's gonna lead to what's called a thick cloud rule violation. If you would like to show um, the forecast for primary day. I have a 40% chance of go. I know that's not what you want to see, um, but, uh, and you guys might be wondering, wow, thick clouds, who cares? Um, the thing is, is that even though it might not impact your daily lives, you don't need a jacket, you're not going to you know, you know, worry about a thunderstorm getting struck by lightning, uh, it does impact a rocket. And to explain that, I need to explain the difference between, between rocket-triggered lightning and natural lightning. Natural lightning occurs when you've got a cloud that's strong enough, has a strong enough electric field that generates its own lightning strikes. However, um, not rocket-triggered lightning occurs when a cloud has an electric field that's not strong enough for lightning, but if you add a conductive object like a rocket to the electric field, it enhances it, and that's how you get a rocket-triggered lightning strike. Now, the thick cloud rule is one of the conditions where that can occur. It's when you have uh, a cloud that's relatively thick with um, lots of mixed-phase particles, so you're looking at temperatures between 0 and minus 20 Celsius, um, and that is enough of a condition for those rocket-triggered lightning strikes to potentially occur. Uh, what we're forecasting is a roughly 10,000-foot thick cloud um, with uh, temperatures between minus 11 and minus 20. Now, if the cloud is completely colder than minus 15, that's just, just ice crystals, no mixed phase particles, so you're not expecting to have a strong electric field, um, statistically speaking. Um, but we are expecting it to be um, in that temperature range where it could be a threat. Um, so I've put in a 40% chance of go, uh, which is a 60% chance of violation. Um, the definition of that is that it's more likely to happen than not. It's not higher because while we are confident that this, uh, this condition is going to occur, there is significant difference in our weather tools um, with regards to the timing. It's going to last roughly 6 to 12 hours, but 
somewhere between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. on Halloween night to Tuesday morning. So uh, as we get closer to the forecast, I will either increase or decrease the POV based on, based on our certainty and the consistency in our tools. Um, that's the only threat on primary day. Uh, be so oh, one more thing. Uh, upper level winds, sorry. Um, we're looking at the winds being out of the south, uh, west-southwest, um, roughly 70 knots. Uh, safety is sh has demonstrated that that is not uh, at above risk levels at the moment, uh, but if that increases a little bit, that might be a problem. The reason that's a problem is if you get winds out of the west-southwest, and there's a non-nominal launch, um, then what you could end up with is the debris pushing over populated areas. So we want to be careful about launching into conditions where you have um, winds from that direction that are strong. Um, now, if you would like to show the backup day, um, unfortunately, it's not a whole lot better. Uh, it is a little bit better, but not a whole lot. Uh, the, what happens is once that uh, moisture moves out, we're going to get that front to push, push through. Now, that front is going to cause precipitation, uh, elevated winds, thick clouds like usual, but also disturbed weather, which is elevated, um, elevated particles um, with that precipitation that can lead to rocket-triggered lightning as well. The reason why it's lower, as in 40% chance of p uh, probability of violation or 60% chance of go, is because we're, um, well, there's a less consistency on the timing of the frontal passage. It's only gonna last three hours, but again, somewhere in that 12-hour period, uh, once the models, our, our weather models, weather tools get more consistent on the exact timing, then uh, we'll be able to adjust the POV, uh, probability of violation accordingly. Um, we are also looking at increased ground winds. Um, luckily, they're from the northwest, uh, which is going to be our most tolerant direction. We don't want the rocket to tip over, um, but luckily from the northwest, it is, um, it, it is sheltered a little bit more. Um, so we are looking at um, st uh, steady 11 to 17 miles per hour with gusts up to 25 miles per hour. Um, they th uh, it's not as well below the threshold, um, but uh, looking at uh, 43 different uh, past weather events that are similar, this is certainly much weaker than those, and all of those cause violations barely. So we are looking at um, probably not violating um, uh, ground winds, but there's always a chance that the models could show it strengthening as we get closer. I will continue to monitor it, but unfortunately we're looking at potentially um, uh, active weather. Thank Back you. to you, Megan. Thank you, Captain. Uh, this is a, a pre-launch briefing for our weather satellite, so I expected the weather briefing to be very detailed, so I appreciate that. <laughs> all right. No, no, don't apologize at all. Uh, so thank you, everyone for, everyone, for your opening remarks. It's time for some questions. So again, if you are in the room and have some questions, just raise your hand. Um, or uh, if you want to get off the question queue on the phone, hit star one. Uh, and I do know we actually have a lot of social media questions coming in already, so let's take the first one, if you don't mind. Allison? Our first question from social, when was JPSS2 built? So I'll take that. I think it, you, although the JPSS program has been going on since 20, 2010 roughly, it's been before that it was, re, it was named from another program, but the satellite takes roughly about five years to build. Um, the last two years have been really environmental tests, so you have to bring all the components together you have to bring instruments from four different locations. We integrate them in one location. In this case, it was in Gilbert, Arizona, at north of Grumman. And uh, by that time, you know, we have an environmental test campaign, and now we're ready for launch. Great. And actually, Allison, keep the mic, because I know we have a lot coming in, so go ahead. Awesome. Yeah, another JPSS2 question. Uh, where exactly is it going? Can you tell us more about the orbit? Yes, it, it is in something called a polar sun synchronous orbit. So we're going to go at a slightly retrograde orbit coming off. Yeah, we're going to go due south, um, or nearly due south, uh, when we uh, leave on Monday or Tuesday morning. And we're going to be um, in something called a, a the sun synchronous orbit means that basically relative to the sun, the plane of the orbit doesn't move. And so therefore, um, when it comes up, it's you, you hear something called the local time of ascending node. Every time it crosses the equator going north, it's, it's at 1.30 p.m. local time, local solar time. And so that, therefore, that, that, that information is very important to the users um, that use our data because it's that time of the afternoon is when the weather starts to really kick up. We have partners in Europe that uh, build another satellite that is also in a different orbit, but it's in the mid-morning orbit. And so therefore, by, by getting these uh, spatially distributed uh, measurements, we can actually integrate them into our models and give us better forecasts. Yep, you again. <laughs> All right, uh, another lo uh, no, a lofted question. When will lofted return 
is it going to be recovered, and if so, where? Yeah, uh, lofted. This mission is actually very short, uh, and so um, about two hours after launch, it will be splashing down uh, just off the uh, off the coast of uh, a few hundred miles off the coast of Hawaii. Um, the intent for us, the plan for us, is to um, to we have ship ready to go collect it and and retrieve it, as well as a, a separate data recorder. Uh, that's ejected, so we have a, a dual ch chance or triple chance actually on the on the data itself. Okay. Any in the room here? I do know we have reporters here. Okay. Again, if you are on the phone, we do see a couple of you on the phone. To ask a question, you have to hit star one. Okay. Um, what is this? Is one from social media? So sorry about that. What is the biggest challenge with this mission? It's a unique mission. It's it's two missions at once. I can, I can go first, I guess. Um, <laughs> I do believe that the integration of the Lofted and the JPSS payload, I saw a NASA press release, I call it a super stack. And so it's a unique uh, in, uh, orientation or, or system that we've put into this rocket, this last one from uh, Vandenberg, um, the last Atlas, I should say. But I, I do think that the most difficult part is making sure that every instrument works perfectly. And we do such a rigorous, uh, we have to make sure that these last in orbit for they last a design life of seven years, but we expect them, they usually last much longer. And so we try to make sure that we test them thoroughly and make sure that uh, um, they're completely functional when we, when we launch. That's to me the most difficult thing, is to make sure that we've checked every box to make sure that we're ready for orbit. I do wanna just go back on one, question, one comment earlier, is I did say that to build a satellite it would take roughly five years, and that's not truly indicative of the development time for these instruments. And I do want to emphasize that uh, something of this complexity usually takes almost 10 to 15 years to build the instruments, to design them, design the spacecraft and launch. I was referring specifically to J2 when everything came together is roughly the last burst of energy is that five years. And, and, and I'll add uh, also to, to that question in terms of it's almost always the integration that, that um, is the hardest thing that to do, right? And in our case, um, it's the integration in, integration of this uh, this um, inflatable decelerator into the, the reentry vehicle and, and timing and stuff like that. And then especially the integration with our partner in ULA, uh, they're providing some of the hardware that goes into this demonstration. They're providing the launch and the integration to that stuff. And, and so that part, is, it's a tremendous partnership, but it's always the most complex thing. Jim, this is a question I believe for you. You know, Lofted is the largest blunt object to reenter. How does this compare to shuttle? Uh, let's see. I don't remember how. Sh how <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to get back to you. That's okay. <laughs> Sometimes these social but, questions. But twenty be. meters. Well, let's see. Well, the payload. Uh, I will get back. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the payload bay. Uh, no, uh, no worries. No worries. I do see a hand in the room here. Give us one sec. We'll get the mic over to you. Hi. This is. Oh. Okay. Hi, this is Karen Cruz Arduña with KEYT. My question is, you mentioned about integration and so forth. How crucial was that, you know, during this process? How crucial was that to have those two integrated in this mission? I, I would say, well, first of all, there's two missions that we're integrating, correct? Uh, but there are also four, four instruments that come together with the satellite. So there's a number of different integration points that are so critical, one of which is we've been working with Lofted for a number of years, but primarily understanding the interfaces between the, the, their mission and our mission. The satellite itself, um, the definition of those interfaces is so important. We are actually launching four instruments that are on previously on the NOAA-20 spacecraft and previously to that on SNPP. They're now on a different spacecraft, so the integration is a first of its kind for this mission. And, and if you don't get it right, even some small detail, the mission fails. Okay. We have another one from social. This is for you, Omar. Of the 100 missions, which one stands out the most for you, or which one's your favorite? Oh, boy. It's like <laughs> asking me which is my favorite child. Um, I don't know. I, I, I could span a lot of missions. I could tell you the most difficult, the easiest, but um, the, the sexiest ones are the uh, Mars uh, rovers, and I've been a part of that since uh, Sojourner. So, uh, and I had the, uh, the great um, opportunity to launch every single one of them since Sojourner as the launch director for them. So, it does have a, a special place in my heart. Um, and it's cool that um, you can pass that on to 
to the whole world. It's not just us and our nation. It's uh, the whole world going to another world. And uh, that's something else. But I could sit here for hours and talk to you about Pluto New Horizons and how fast that was leaving the Earth and how difficult that was to get off this planet. And uh, other missions like ICON um, that were tough to get off this Earth too. And uh, yeah, it goes on and on. So I, I don't have favorite children. I just have great fond memories. <laughs> Well, what I think is so cool about the Launch Services Program is you guys do uh, launch a lot of, of science, very diverse science, so really you've left your, your impact uh, on a lot of the research that's happening on Earth. So, Yeah, it, it, some of that has, uh, you know, when, when we look back at, at where this, uh, where JPSS is going, it's flying in formation with other spacecraft that we had a part in launching. And uh, it, it's fantastic to see that, that, hey, we were a part of all these other um, missions that are flying information and getting this vital uh, information to get the, the weather service guys the, the tools they need to, to do their guessing. So it's, it's awesome. Right. <laughs> oh, we have another one in the crowd here. So I know on social media there was a question of what was the biggest challenge. Um, what was the biggest highlight of this whole, you know, trek? I'll take that one. <clears throat> I remember this maybe relates to a challenge, but I remember two and a half years ago when we entered the pandemic, um, it was a tremendous challenge for everyone in the world. Uh, but, you know, when you look at, at what it takes to build a satellite, right, I mean, you need people there on site physically uh, working on the hardware. And there were a lot of people in those early days that put themselves at significant risk, you know, because they were dedicated to the mission. They knew that this that this mission was vital for the health and safety of Americans. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and so they they went in, you know, to the office and they went into the labs and the clean rooms and they and they made sure this thing was built and it was tested and it was going to work. And um, you know, I, I think it's it's tremendous how how our entire community mobilized to to bring this system together against, you know, those those huge obstacles that that we're all familiar with. Great question. Thank you so much. Uh, and then we have a question right here. Can we just, yep. Uh, thank you, Hunter Kilpatrick, HKP Space News. I have a question about Lofted. Um, is there a simulated mass that Lofted is carrying? And if so, how much weight is that? Um, the entire package is around 2,400, 2,500 pounds. Uh, um, so, the, and there is, um, whether it's a simulated mass or something, this is, you know, it's a, a large percentage of it is, is in that. Question. We have another one from social media, so can we get that mic over to Allison over there? Thank you. Awesome. All right, and this one is for Gary. What do you plan to do with the Space Launch Complex 3 after you launch the last Atlas 5? That's a great question. Um, Space Launch Complex 3 will actually be used to launch our Vulcan Centaur. So after launch, the team's going to start. Uh, deintegrating and safing all the hazardous systems so that we can come in and make uh, significant modifications to the platforms, to the facility. Um, the Vulcan Centaur is using different commodities, so we have to run those feed lines in and make those up to the launch platform. So we're going to start a, a significant uh, deintegration and then uh, manufacture a capability to be able to launch Vulcan Centaur with an initial capability early in the spring of 24. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. That is going to end our news conference. Thank you to those who asked questions as well as to those who answered it from our dais here. Um, we will have another briefing tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific time, and that one's going to go a little more in depth about the science behind both JPSS2 and Lofted. And then, like I said, Tuesday's 36-minute launch window will open at open at 2.25 a.m. Pacific time. Live coverage will begin on NASA TV and its YouTube and social media channels 40 minutes before, so that's 1.45 a.m. Pacific time. In the meantime, you can find out more about each mission if you follow the websites you see on your screen there. That's noaa.gov slash jpss2 launch. And then there's also nasa.gov slash lofted. Okay, again, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you on Tuesday.